who have a problem with alcohol and are seeking a way out. Alcoholics Anonymous is a fellowship of men and women who share their experience, strength, and hope with each other that they may solve their common problem and help others to recover from alcoholism. The only requirement for membership is a desire to stop drinking. There are no dues or fees for AA membership. We are self-supporting through our own contributions. AA is not allied with any organization or institution, does not wish to engage in any controversy, neither endorses nor opposes any causes. Our primary purpose is to stay sober and help other alcoholics to achieve sobriety. Tonight, we have asked Red M. to read how it works. Thank you, Joe. I'm Red Moel, and I'm an alcoholic. This is how this program works. Rarely have we seen a person fail who has thoroughly followed our path. Those who do not recover are people who cannot or will not completely give themselves to this simple program. Usually men and women who are constitutionally incapable of being honest with themselves. There are such unfortunates. They're not at fault. They seem to have been born that way. They are naturally incapable of grasping and developing a manner of living which demands rigorous honesty. Their chances are less than average. There are those, too, who suffer from grave emotional and mental disorders, but many of them do recover if they have the capacity to be honest. Our stories disclose in a general way what we used to be like, what happened, and what we're like now. If you've decided you want what we have and are willing to go to any length to get it, then you're ready to take certain steps. At some of these we balked. We thought we could find an easier, softer way, but we could not. With all the earnestness at our command, we beg of you to be fearless and thorough from the very start. Some of us have tried to hold on to our old ideas, and the result was nil until we let go absolutely. Remember that we deal with alcohol, cunning, baffling, powerful. Without help, it's too much for us. But there is one who has all power. That one is God. May you find him now. Half measures availed us nothing. We stood at the turning point. We ask his protection and care with complete abandon. Here are the steps we took which are suggested as a program of recovery. One, we admitted we were powerless over alcohol, that our lives had become unmanageable. Two, came to believe that a power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity. Three, made a decision to turn our will and our lives over to the care of God as we understood him. Four, made a searching and fearless moral inventory of ourselves. Five, admitted to God, to ourselves, and to another human being the exact nature of our wrongs. Six, were entirely ready to have God remove all these defects of character. Seven, humbly asked him to remove our shortcomings. Eight, made a list of all persons we had harmed and became willing to make amends to them all. Nine, made direct amends to such people wherever possible, except when to do so would injure them or others. Ten continued to take personal inventory, and when we were wrong, promptly admitted it. Eleven sought through prayer and meditation to improve our conscious contact with God as we understood him, praying only for knowledge of his will for us and the power to carry that out. Twelve, having had a spiritual awakening as a result of these steps, we tried to carry this message to alcoholics and to practice these principles in all our affairs. Many of us explain what an order I can go through with it. Do not be discouraged. No one among us, us has been able to maintain anything like perfect adherence to these principles. We're not saints. The point is that we're willing to grow along spiritual lines. The principles we have set down are guides to progress. We claim spiritual progress rather than spiritual perfection. Our description of the alcoholic, the chapter to the agnostic, and our personal adventures before and after make clear three pertinent ideas. A, that we were alcoholic and could not manage our own lives. B, that probably no human power could have relieved our alcoholism. C, that God could and would if he were so. Thank you, Joe. Thank you, Red. We have asked Mary Lou S. to read the traditions. I'm Mary Lou, and I'm an alcoholic. And these are the 12 traditions. One, our common welfare should come first. Personal recovery depends upon AA unity. Two, for our group purpose, there is but one ultimate authority, a loving God as he may express himself in our group conscience. 
Our leaders are but trusted servants. They do not govern. Three, the only requirement for AA membership is a desire to stop drinking. Four, each group should be autonomous except in matters affecting other groups or AA as a whole. Five, each group has but one primary purpose, to carry its message to the alcoholic who still suffers. Six, an AA group ought never endorse, finance, or lend the AA name to any related facility or outside enterprise, lest problems of money, property, and prestige divert us from our primary purpose. Seven, every AA group ought to be fully self-supporting, declining outside contributions. Eight, Alcoholics Anonymous should remain forever non-professional, but our service centers may employ special workers. Nine, AA as such ought never be organized, but we may create service boards or committees directly responsible to those they serve. Ten, alcohol has no opinion on outside issues, hence the AA name ought never be drawn into public controversy. Eleven, our public relations policy is based on attraction rather than promotion. We need always maintain personal anonymity at the level of press, radio, and films. Twelve, anonymity is the spiritual foundation of our traditions, ever reminding us to place principles before personalities. Thank you, Mary Lou. We've asked Sarah D. to read the promises. Thank you, Diane. I'm an alcoholic. These are beautiful promises that are found on page 83 and 84 of the big book. If we are painstaking about this phase of our development, we will be amazed before we are halfway through. We are going to know a new freedom and a new happiness. We will not regret the past, nor wish to shut the door on it. We will comprehend the word serenity, and we will know peace. No matter how far down it can benefit others, that feeling of uselessness and self-pity will disappear. We will lose interest in selfish things and gain interest in our fellow man. Self-seeking will slip away. Our whole attitude, fear of people and of economic insecurity will leave us. We will intuitively know how to handle situations which used to baffle us. We will suddenly realize that God is doing for us. Thank you, Sarah. We have no dues or fees, but we do have expenses. And for those of you who are not familiar with the charter group, we are separate from Peachford Hospital. We operate exactly the same as any other A. We do meet at the hospital, but we pay rent. We pay for contributions to General Service Office in New York, to our intergroup office here in Atlanta, and to our state assembly and our prepaid convention. Introduce our speaker, who most of you know and or at least know of. He is a great individual. I have a... Uh, very grateful source in Washington, D.C., who is my helper, uh, offers me all my help that reminded me this evening that Sandy B. would be in some 48 hours entering his 18th year of sobriety. I'm not going to take but one second, maybe two, to tell you something about him that I heard this that I think says it all about him. I was speaking with a chap who Sandy happens to sponsor, and he said, I did not know that Sandy was his sponsor, and he said, he affirmed me and loved me in all my brokenness. That is a tight man, the type program that he has. Let's give a nice charter group welcome to Sandy B. from Washington, D.C. Thank you. Thank you very much. And there we go. 
Good evening, everybody. My name is Sandy Beach, and I'm an alcoholic. How are you all doing? I am indeed uh, grateful to be here tonight and to be sober and to be at another AA meeting. It's my favorite place to be is at these meetings, and I do enjoy them immensely, and I thank Conway for uh, asking me down. I'm uh, always delighted to be part of this. And um, if we have any guests uh, who are at their first AA meeting or anybody who is new to the fellowship, this is a typical Alcoholics Anonymous meeting that um, <laughs> we're having. Um, due to the fantastic success of all the treatment centers in the country, we're getting into the program before we even lose our tuxedo. Um, I think it's jealousy. I think I probably want to be one, you know. Uh, but as I heard in a good line this afternoon, you know, there's a lot of uh, doctors who are also alcoholics, and they're being sponsored by other doctors. And uh, you really hear some great advice being passed out when you mix those two. And um, this one was a uh, particular sponsor was sponsoring a surgeon. And he'd only been sober about two weeks. And he said, now, listen, I'm going to give you one piece of advice. No, do not make a major incision for one year. And, uh, he was shaking his head, yes, and so I guess it's going to work. Anyway, um, it is customary at an AA meeting to share a little bit about how we got here and um, what the illness was like for us. And uh, then a little bit about the AA program. And I just could talk and talk about Alcoholics Anonymous. I um, cannot properly put it into words how I feel about it. It's just the most remarkable um, fellowship that I could imagine in my mind. And yet, when I think back during my childhood and growing up and my drinking years, it's the last place I ever would have wanted to be. If you had described it to me, I would have said, wonderful, but I sure don't hope I don't end up there. I mean, that was the feeling. No matter how well you describe it, it's not the kind of place you would actively seek out as an alternative uh, to some other lifestyle until the other lifestyle becomes vomiting. Then, uh, maybe I'll check it out. It's one of these strange things that uh, the best deal of all is the last resort. Uh, it's really strange, but that's the way it is with spiritual programs, I'm beginning to uh, realize, uh, as they are disclosed to us, and they are through religions and various philosophies and so on down. They sound interesting, and they really sound like they're going to work, but they don't look like they'd be any fun. And I can remember hearing about that as a little kid. You know, I'm in church, and I'm hearing about uh, spiritual principles. I suppose we were all taught some of them uh, growing up, and I heard about them, and I thought there'd be a damn good deal later. Uh, because as I analyze them in my own personal life, they were going to cramp my style severely. I mean, I don't know about the God that you were taught about, but the one I was taught about was, I don't think, would have approved of most of my life. And uh, so if I had gotten into that, I would have had to change. And the people who were not out carousing and drinking looked like they were dulling away. Uh, Buck D. up in Washington just calls, says that. You know, the, the sobriety looked like people just sort of wasting away over there, sitting on a couch, sort of just with dust collecting on their head. Uh, they weren't getting in trouble, but on the other hand, it wasn't a very attractive lifestyle. There was just sort of nothing happening. And uh, so I think I heard a lot of the principles that are found here in Alcoholics Anonymous, but as the Bible says, they were falling on deaf ears. There wasn't much interest in uh, what there was to offer there because, like uh, every other little kid, I had the feeling that I could figure it out better and I could probably put a little English on it and come out with a better product in the long run. 
And uh, so I was searching out for my own identity, for my own way. I had picked up certain ideas about life. I don't know where all of you put together your philosophy of life or your game plan for living uh, as you were rolling into age 12 or 13 or wherever we put a cast in concrete, our plan for the rest of our life. I think a lot of it gets formed there. I learned several of the major truths that I stuck with uh, off of the little boy's bathroom walls uh, was where I picked up a lot of the real insights into the real world. I don't know who put them there, but I was very grateful. Was that right? I didn't know that. Hmm. (laughs) Tucked that one away, you know. I said, geez, you know, and same truths are still being written out there. I guess there must be something about it, but uh, I put these things away, and I never checked them out with anybody because uh, I had developed... um, a non-sharing philosophy. I had this uh, early on uh, New England upbringing where I essentially saw the world as a dog-eat-dog place. And uh, what we were essentially about as a human race was competition. And the name of the game was to win and to get past the other people, to get higher grades, to get on the teams. And uh, there was winners and then there was everybody else. And if you weren't a winner, then you were just somebody else out there. And I had that awful feeling that I would just end up being somebody else, you know, the one And uh, I um, remember these things, so I would try harder uh, to either study or to go out for sports. And it was uh, my, and I just got this deeply ingrained that a man should be able somehow through his own resources to accomplish anything. And that um, any failure along the way was strictly due to not digging deep enough within or not trying hard enough. And uh, as life went along, uh, and I eventually did have, and I always kind of mention this uh, because there's generally a few people in the audience that relate to it, and that is my earliest introduction to my higher power was in the Catholic Church up in New England, and my only memory as a little six-year-old boy, and I say this almost every meeting, was a nun came out and said, Welcome, little boy, you're in trouble. (laughs) And uh, let me explain. Mostly I remember having purgatory explained to me. And, uh, boy, this is is really a bad place you're going to end up, and uh, how many years and all of these things. And I took it literally. I took everything. I have a very open mind on these things. I'm a real sucker for things, you know, but that's why this program's working so well. I just go, hey, right. I just hang around in these smoky basements and everything will be all right. Are you sure? Yes. Okay. So don't knock it. This is the only way to live. Otherwise, you go around and be absolutely neurotic. There's a bomb is going to go off in your briefcase. And uh, it's much better to just be trusting. And you get taken once in a while, but the stress is much less. Over the long haul, much better to be this way. Just believe everything and come on in. But um, the um, er early experiences, um, which I took quite literally, did create some sort of a distorted perspective of self-centeredness and guilt and so on down and caused me to um, uh, really feel unique and isolated. And this is a common occurrence I'm finding in talking to other alcoholics and other human beings. My guy, we're really talking about human dilemmas uh, that just happen to end up um, being displayed uh, by somebody getting very drunk. But I really relate to more to being a human being than anything else. And this is just the nature of growing up and the anxieties and of maturing and so on down and problems that are just faced by everybody. And uh, they became acute, uh, maybe in my case, the nervousness and the sweating and not being able to fit in with people and just wondering, how does this get straightened out? And I was always looking in the wrong place for the answer. As I look back on it now, I was always looking outside for the answer. I was looking for a signal from you. I was looking for somebody to raise their hand and say, you belong at this table, over here, over here. I was looking for directions from somewhere never realizing that all of it lay within me if I ever would take the time to search. Uh, Somehow I had dismissed that at an early age, that there was any valid information to be found inside. That uh, just didn't make sense. I couldn't see it. And I was looking for 
fixing whatever this pain is. I don't know, I use this, I'm just searching for words whenever I'm trying to describe these uh, process of growing up, I just uh, connected that there was just a lot of pain and anxiety and there was something missing. Uh, something wasn't quite right inside, whatever that is. And as life goes on, it seems like a girl will fix that. I remember that was the first idea that occurred to me. You know, if a girl would fix whatever this problem is. Then later on, I had the idea that money appears to me to be the real solution to this pain, whatever it is, and then maybe uh, prestige. The more I think about it, prestige is what will do it. And I was always looking over the next fence because whenever you get a little bit of the money and you finally get a girlfriend, you still have these feelings. What's wrong with this girl? Doesn't she know how to fix these problems? And uh, What's the matter with this money? Uh, I thought once you got it, uh, I'm still nervous. I'm afraid they'll take it away from me. Um, what does fix this? problem, whatever we're describing here. I, most of us, you know what I'm talking about, just the whole problem of being alive, the whole question of who am I, why am I alive, where am I going, what is all this really about? And if it's possible, one way to solve all of those uh, common human uh, dilemmas is to not think about them. Boy, that's a real good way to solve that problem, become a workaholic. And so I'm too busy to think about those. I've got a job, responsibilities. I'm down here 24 hours a day. And uh, I'm just totally absorbed in that. And then there comes a crisis at age 50 or something. You know, I haven't figured out why I'm here. I'm important, but I don't know why. Uh, you know, and then boom, that hits. Um, and so I think I'm just describing, so far, sort of a skinny, neurotic uh, teenager wandering around with typical teenage problems. Uh, bouncing here and there with a lot of guilt and not hacking it too well in church, but, you know, getting grades, no particular big family problems, uh, reasonable background, just sort of there it sits. So I don't know if I look upon uh, anything particularly uniquely different at this stage of the game until alcohol arrived on the scene. Uh, then I find that I did part company from some of my classmates uh, because the alcohol came along at a rather late age. Now that I've been in AA a while, I find that I was a late bloomer at age 19. Uh, we've got kids up in Washington, I'm sure you do down here, who uh, by the time they're 19, they're celebrating five years sobriety, you know. And, uh, and they're sponsoring people, you know. And, and you see one of those kids and they go, who's that, your father? And he says, no, my pigeon. Boy, I'll tell you, AA is changing daily uh, as you look around, and that's great. Uh, that speaks well for the fellowship, that we are capable of this kind of expansion and change and so on down, but still maintain our basic principles. It's one of the amazing parts of the fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous. But at any rate, the uh, day came when... Drinking was appropriate behavior. Uh, it certainly was. Other people my age and peer group had been drinking for a year or two. So I think it was kind of unusual that I was holding out. But if I recall, there was some ground rule within the church that if you didn't drink till you were 21, you got a half million years off from purgatory. And uh, I vaguely remember sort of shooting for that. But there came emergency situations that obviously were more important than purgatory. It's amazing how the daily things uh, and the way we balance things out. You ever notice uh, when we lose our perspective and you just go, no, 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 this one more drink is more important than my family and my job. Bloop, and down it goes. You know, hmm, strange way you think. Uh, but anyway, I did have a drink during a social event where I was particularly nervous. There were people all around, and uh, I drank the whiskey down and had the feeling that it didn't work. And I sat, sat there sort of panic-stricken. I, I had been guaranteed certain results from drinking whiskey by my roommates. One of them was you would feel good. And I'll tell you, I really wanted to feel good. Uh, that had not been something, a, a close friend. I had not been feeling good in a long time. And uh, I really felt for the longest, the first five or six minutes, that uh, I was going to be left out uh, of the uh, effects of alcohol. 
But as I like to say, about 10 minutes went down, uh, went by with a couple of drinks down, and I sat there puzzling about why alcohol wasn't doing anything to me when I looked up and saw that all of the people in the room had been changed by the alcohol. <laughs> and they were all smiling and waving at me and saying, hello, you over there, you haven't joined any groups yet. Come over with us. We like you intensely. And I went, really? I've never been around people who like me this much. Let me join in. And uh, I was overwhelmed with love. I drank and people love me. I, and, I, and you say, it's just amazing uh, how wrong that is. We're just incredibly lovable from our side. I just saw love in your eyes and you wanted me over there and I came over and bored you with 12 jokes. And you just loved it. And I just sat there. found in uh, about 10 minutes, as far as I was concerned, was the secret of life. Period. I had, it just went right in there. I just, just something. I already was thinking ahead. This will, if this works here, it'll work in classroom situations. It'll work in traffic jams. It'll work in uh, family reunions. It'll work at funerals, weddings, recitals, plays, movies, football games. I mean, I saw the universality of alcohol in the first ten minutes. Right there. That's, I mean, it was not a casual acquaintance that took place right there. This was a monumental friendship that was developed in the first 15 minutes. I went on, this is going to be very important to me to keep close relationship with alcohol. I just suddenly, the fear of the future was gone. I had no fear of the future at all. It was just like, as long as they keep producing alcohol, who could worry? What, what situation could be out there that alcohol couldn't calm down, that alcohol couldn't smooth out? I just saw it as the universal power. You just took it and you applied it to whatever situation came up. Uh, within a week or so, I had absolute faith in it. I knew where to get it, how to handle it. I had gotten over throwing up and dry heaves and all that. I got that out of the way right away and was on my way with a special power. And it gave me a great deal of confidence. And you know, it's a funny thing about how our faith in this chemical carries over. You don't even have to be drinking it uh, to have this faith. Just knowing it's out in the car. Uh, you know what I mean? You're in a real tough situation, like your boss comes in and said, um, how do you spell your last name? And you're going, God, I knew he'd ask a tricky one. He wants to really, he wants to really catch me up here. You know one of those uh, things, and you're shaking and trembling in the later stages, and you go, God, i got to get through this, you know. And, oh, and then you just go, oh, compartment is vodka. If it really gets bad, I can go out and get it. And just knowing that I could go out and get it, just knowing that it was there would bring a little smile on my face. And I'd look at him, I'd go, you almost had me there for a minute, you know. <laughs> Fortunately, I tied in to my power in the glove compartment and uh, we're not nervous anymore. And just knowing that it was there. And then I found that... Uh, some of us, when we get into Alcoholics Anonymous, go home, as one fellow did. Uh, I remember hearing this story many, many years ago. He came to his first AA meeting and heard one speaker, and he was so overpowered by the entire uh, force of the program of Alcoholics Anonymous that he rushed into his house, told his family, get out of the way, get out of the way, and he went in and cleaned out the linen closet, the liquor closet, behind the bathtub under the toilet all of the places where the booze was and poured every drop of booze in the house down the toilet seven hours later he flushed it and uh, it was at that point that he accepted his illness up until then it was still an option and you go back and look in there but anyway we have such faith in this that when we get sober very often, we don't have any alcohol in the house, but we might have a $50 bill in a secret compartment in our wallet, which we're not telling our sponsors about or anybody else, for that matter. And uh, it's just sort of there, just in case. All this stuff we're hearing here is wrong. You know what I mean? They got those 12 steps up there, and they got these traditions, and they got these wonderful promises. But, well, you know, how do I know that's going to happen to me? Uh, I can see that it does happen to other people, but I am different, unique, and all of that background comes in. And a guy has to protect himself, after all, 
Uh, you have to be practical about this. It's possible God could not like me, could have singled me out. Uh, I was real mean to my sister growing up. And uh, you got to look out for yourself. And I, so I would have that, and just knowing the money was there would produce this same and that same sort of security. Just in case, boom, I'm gone, I'm in the car, i got the money, I know the address at a package store, all is well. And it's very difficult to get the program working when we haven't cut all the bonds with our previous higher power, uh, which for me was vodka. started out being classier stuff, but I found out in the end that a real solid, consistent, friendly, reliable, or out of the bottle, either one, but it just had... It was just there, and there, there wasn't any showbiz about it. It just, boom, boom, right, down. Uh, and just like the postman, it went through its appointed rounds, down to the feet, out to the hands, up to the brain, all around, calm, peace, calm, right, yeah, okay, phew, hi. You know, and uh, what do you got, world? What do you got out here? What do you got for me today? Uh, we are ready. And I really relate to that. Um, I think it was Sammy Davis Jr. Somebody was t telling Dean Martin he's going to go out and sing sober. And Dean Martin said, you're going out there alone? Uh, go in front of that crowd alone? And I really related to that. You don't want to be alone uh, in this world. It's too rough being out there alone. And, of course, that's where I felt I was. And I, because um, I, I didn't share. I didn't fit in. I was not part of a group. Because at age 19, I took a detour in the growing up process. I stopped, and I found that most of us um, who, who uh, end up relying on some other alternative power base uh, do stop maturing. We continue to ripen and uh, age, but the maturing process seems to uh, stop. And um, therefore, our relationships with other people cease, and we're just not part of our peer group anymore. We're just a distant. And uh, it's a very strange feeling. It's just one person against the world. And there's a, you see people relating, you understand that, that they believe they're relating, and you start developing emotions like a monkey does. Oh, I see. You should smile. Good. I will feel that way. And uh, it doesn't come from inside. It isn't real. And you're trying to show it like you see the neighbor showing love to his children. Oh, yes, I see. Hug, kiss, do all those kind of things. But it isn't, you don't mean it. And you know you don't mean it. And you hope they don't know that you don't mean it. And you're terrified they're going to find out that you don't mean it. So you don't do it anymore. Because it's better that way. They can be in doubt. And it's a very painful existence. Uh, much better served by drinking more so that you don't think about these kinds of situations. And there were a lot of painful ones. Um, just by way of background music, I ended up in the Marine Corps and flew airplanes for 12 or 13 years, and that's how I got my drinking money, was flying around, and uh, it was, that was my source of income. All uh, drinkers need to get income or a gun, <laughs> one or the other. And... Um, because you must have alcohol. It's an absolute essential in this whole deal. Uh, it just won't work without it. And so my uh, life story goes through being a pilot and flying around. It's very exciting, but it doesn't have anything to do with alcoholism. It, had, it was just an inner, that's sort of like, what part of the country are you from? And so I'm from Marine Corps, New England. <laughs> and um, that it doesn't add anything to the story, but some people keep track of things like that. And they go, I wonder where that guy's from. I don't want to go to that part of the country. Uh, but I did do that drinking in the Marine Corps. It was a lot of fun, a lot of excitement, and so on down. But deep down inside, I knew something was wrong. I knew something was getting worse every year. That I didn't know what it was. Um, naturally, I, didn't. I tried to search the world out there. I would look. I would go, well, I'm having too many kids. There's six kids around. I don't have any money left over. There's no place at the table to sit down. and crowded around the house. <laughs> Uh, maybe it's this. It's so noisy. Everybody's yelling. Oh, no wonder. That's probably causing it. And then I'm being transferred every year. Never have roots. You know, I don't have a house. I'm, rah, rah, rah. Then I'm flying dangerous airplanes. Well, that must be it. And then the Marine Corps is mean. You know, that kind of stuff. And, uh, so maybe that's why I don't feel good and don't fit in. But there was this sense of going nowhere. You know what I mean? Every time I got to some goal that I had set, the goal became worthless. Because I had achieved it, 
And I remember finally becoming a captain and a pilot and being in a, this big uh, fighter squadron, and I felt like, this is nothing. I'm here, and it has no value. There's no meaning to my life to be here. Uh, maybe it's next week I'm going to find out something. And one way to deal with all of these uh, problems is to keep a party going all the time. Just keep it going, you know, with people telling jokes and all that, and then maybe if you just stay stimulated all the time, uh, you wouldn't sit back and contemplate suicide or whatever was going on in our brain. Just stay uh, involved. Just keep busy, drinking, party, uh, this kind of stuff. But that you can't do that. As a human being, there comes a time, no matter how hard you try, when you turn around and there you are. Boom. Oh, God, I'm here. And then it starts. And that damn brain starts in. And it goes, oh, I'm glad to see you. It's, you know, like, it hasn't seen me in a while. I've been busy. And I, my conscience corners me in a bedroom or something. He says, where have you been? What about 1953? What about 1957? What about your mother-in-law? What about this thing here? What about the money you owe? If you're commanding officer ever does die. And all of these true facts and all these things I had never done. I never taken out insurance policies. I didn't have health plans. I didn't have this. I never went to the dentist. I, you know, all of the normal things that are just stockpiling up the bills, the all of the things undone are just there. And I'm going, I hate all those things. And I hated them because I hadn't done any of them. And they were always there. Life was going by me and I had never lived it. And I had a tremendous fear of death. Oh, it was just awful. And I realize now, for me, uh, the fear of death is really the fear of never having lived. That it was going to be all over and I was going to miss it. And it wasn't where I was going, it's that I missed this. And I knew that. I knew that something was fundamentally wrong. And I was quite grateful, now in retrospect, that a uh, convulsion came along, followed by the DTs and the hospitalization and the nut wars and so on down to stop uh, this particular situation in its tracks and end me up in 1964 in the uh, Bethesda Naval Hospital nut ward in Bethesda, Maryland, where uh, I was introduced to Alcoholics Anonymous. I had become a daily drinker. I won't go through all of these things, but I had suffered malnutrition, I lost about 50 pounds in my last year of drinking. I could just barely eat. It was just one of those things where you just are going phew, right down. And uh, I was just, you know, had a seizure, and that's how I got in there. And um, that got me to Alcoholics Anonymous. I was brought into AA like most of us are. Uh, Corman came into the nut ward and said, all drunks fall in. Boom. Right face and uh, forward march. And I was at an AA meeting and there I was. And I didn't want to be there. I was embarrassed. Uh, this guy, he's from the outside. Now he knew that I was an out. Who else would he tell? <laughs> Anybody new here? You're worried about, uh, you know, people are going to find out you're in AA. Are you worried about that? Is that a legitimate worry? Are you really concerned your neighbors may find out you're an Alcoholics Anonymous? Well, I'm going to tell you something. They are going to find out you're in Alcoholics Anonymous. You know how? They're going to notice you no longer sleep on the hood of your car. <laughs> and uh, they're going to put two and two together, and they're going to say, he probably got an AA. Good for him. That's wonderful. <laughs> but anyway, I did uh, get in here, and that's how most of us get in here, ordered in. Had a great sponsor, real tough guy in the Marine Corps, and we uh, hit it off pretty well. Hit it off, meaning <clears throat> get in the car. Uh, and uh, it was a very strong relationship. He just grabbed my arm and sat me down, and uh, I just didn't drink. And uh, now the years have gone by, and it's been a marvelous sobriety. It has been a great growing up experience. It's been very painful. It's been... Uh, all of these things that had never been done before, and I'm kicking and screaming. I've been forced into them, pushed into them by other people in the group. They're going, well, you haven't done this yet. You're going to have to do that. Oh, when does it end? I thought you could just stop drinking. Isn't that all? You know? Oh, no, that doesn't have anything to do with sobriety. I'm going, what the hell are you talking about? I, mean, I thought not drinking was the name of the game. Oh, that's just our ad. <laughs> Ha <laughs> ha.
<laughs> Once we get you in these smoky basements, then we give you our suggestions. <laughs> what a word. Our 12 suggestions. Hi, ah, you want to stay alive? Try this. And so it's been that. And um, I don't know how, it's, it's almost like trying to describe a miracle. It's very difficult. It's very difficult sometimes to call it a miracle. Miracles in Alcoholics Anonymous occur so uh, routinely that we come to expect them. Uh, I mean, I've noticed over these years, this is adding up to a number of years now. And here comes somebody in, he's shaking and hurting, and he, his life is a mess, his family is crying, there's blah, this whole mess. And, uh, and we say, well, will you agree to go to a meeting every night for six weeks? Oh, okay, I'll agree. And then we all walk out and we go, isn't that great? His whole life's going to straighten out. And we come back about two months later. Oh, right, yeah, that's right. That's around here. That's... What the hell do you think we have these meetings for? Uh, you know, what's the problem? We just saw a miracle. I mean, we just saw something that is uh, very difficult to explain. We just saw something fundamentally change in this person. He isn't walking around missing a drink and resenting a sacrifice that he has made. His life has suddenly been filled with joy from somewhere. Where does joy come from? It used to come from vodka. This isn't just bare white knuckle sobriety. We're talking about a guy who thinks life is a good deal. You talk about it. Well, I haven't got my job back yet. My health is a little borderline. But it's great. And you're going, you've got to be kidding. Are you on something? Yeah. I don't know what it is, but I'm on something. I'm on to something. I don't know. I just keep going to these smoky basements. And things are getting better. And so something is happening. Something is... The, the magnificence of Alcoholics Anonymous is just incredible. Uh, and I realize what we're saying is that the magnificence of God is incredible. The magnificence of a spiritual power is absolutely amazing. And it's wonderful to behold and to label it correctly and to look at someone and say, your spiritual being has finally been ignited. You were trying to kill it all those years with vodka and it has suddenly been nursed back to life and is being developed and nourished in Alcoholics Anonymous, and we are watching the results. And we all sit around and are the results, and we tell a new person, we don't tell them the theory of Alcoholics Anonymous, we say, hey, you throw off a lot, look at those people. Look at them, what, do they look pretty good? And he looks at the results of this way of life and is attracted to those results. We, had, we are our ad, we are the, out in the front, we're the marquee. We're the drunk. We're standing up there and we go, see this? What do you think? He looks and he goes, not bad. Not bad. That's what I thought. I saw these people at these meetings and they're smiling and they're talking. And they got jobs and suits and cars and they're doing things. They're going on vacation. They're going to Florida. They're going here. And I'm going, not bad. Not bad. What's the deal? Don't drink. Go down the basement and we'll tell you down there. Okay. <laughs> What's going on down here? And finally, it became uh, obvious that we were going to eventually talk about God, and we were going to talk about prayer. And I didn't like that. I had tried it once. It didn't work. And that settled that. And they said, oh, that's too bad. You're going to die. Said, well, maybe I'll try it one more time. One more time. Right. I'm, I'm, a, I'm your basic open-minded guy. I'm, especially when I find that death part. Uh, Hmm, you bring that in, okay, on that condition I will. And that's what is a wonderful thing. This is a fatal illness. If it wasn't, oh boy, would we have trouble. If this was only semi-fatal, we'd be semi-spiritual. Hmm. Which produces semi-honesty and semi-sobriety, which is not worth anything. Uh, so we have this thing. And, you know, I am at a loss to explain what, how I feel about it. And so... As a way of getting around to it and wrapping this up, I will share with you a fictional illness that has developed in New England. There's three or four cases up there. And as I, some of my friends in California told me, there's 10 or 12 cases down there, and it's called sober holism. I know you haven't heard of sober holism. It's uh, not an epidemic proportion yet, but it, it is sneaking around. Sober holism, a sober holic, is a person who wants to get drunk but can't. 
Now, you may not think that's serious. You may not think that this is a problem. But to the person with it, it's very frustrating. What they do, they drink one drink and quit. And then complain that they're not drunk and aren't getting the results and all of the bennies that they've heard about from drinking. A lot of us tell them to drink more. And they reject it. Said their parents only had one drink. And they can tell from this one that more aren't going to work. So we're not going to, they're not going to drink anymore. And it presents an interesting situation to try and convince the guy that if he would just drink more, he would indeed get drunk. But he's absolutely convinced, no. Everywhere he goes with his problem. Can you imagine a guy walking into your house and he's saying, you know the problem I got? I have one drink and I can't get drunk. What would you tell him? You'd say, you can't get drunk on one drink. You've got to drink like 10 or 12. He said, no, I can tell after the first one that if I did take the 10, I wouldn't end up there. And you'd look upon this person as a rather obstinate person with other problems than soberallism. <laughs> one of them being a closed mind, uh, some other demented problem. And you say, oh, the, the truth is so obvious, I can't believe this guy is standing here looking me square in the eye with the proposition that he doesn't believe if he drinks enough, he can get drunk. I mean, it's absolutely preposterous. And we would sit there, and he would go from one end of the country to the other and never hear anything else. Everywhere he went, he'd get the same damn message. Drink more. Drink more, man. That's your problem. You're not drinking enough, if that's what you want, to get drunk. And so we come into AA, and you know, you might not see any similarity in here, but I sure do. We come in here, and we get a guy, and he's saying, well, I got problems. Boy, have I got problems. And I'll give you a couple of examples. The guy will come in and he'll say, well, I just lost my job and I'm not sure I'm going to find another one. And you told me this was a sharing group. You told me Alcoholics Anonymous was a place to share your problems. So I'm going to dump it out on the table. What do you do about unemployment? So we start around the table and the first dummy says, have you tried the serenity prayer? And the guy says, the serenity prayer? Uh, I, I don't have a job. Uh, I'll pray when I get the job. I'm, geez, uh, who's next over there, please? Uh, serenity prayer. Next guy said, have you turned your life over to the care of a higher power yet? And the guy's looking at him going, you don't understand. I have unemployment. Uh, my family's going to starve to death. And it goes all the way around the room and they're talking about, how is your spiritual condition? Have you taken an inventory yet? And he goes all the way around back and hears nothing but a broken record uh, at the meeting. So he does what anybody would do. He changes groups. Goes to another AA group. He says, I don't think I explained the damn problem right. Uh, or they wouldn't have been coming up with answers like that. I probably didn't emphasize the, the real problem, which is I don't have a damn job. It was a serenity prayer. And he goes way out in the southern part of Georgia somewhere and brings it up and way in the woods there. These people understand. Starts in with the thing about the no money and the job and right off the bat. You tried that serenity prayer yet? <laughs> He's got a sponsor. And you're going, what is this? People don't hear? People don't hear that I'm walking around with these problems? And you know, it's almost like the drinking was. I look back on the drinking and I went like this. When all else fails, drink. That was the early stages. Then my philosophy as life went along was, right before everything almost fails, <laughs> drink. <laughs> then I got into advanced drinking, and I said, drink first, and then look how everything looks. <laughs> and it didn't look bad. So I didn't complain. It was like an answer. And we come into AA, and we use prayer as a last resort. When all else fails, pray. When all else fails, resort to a higher power. When your whole life is about to collapse, then call upon this higher power in emergency. And um, we come around and we say to somebody, what is your problem? Oh, I'm just so uptight. I'm just so nervous. Have you tried prayer? Oh, yeah. Well, pray more. Oh, no. I can tell from the first two that if I did 80 more, it wouldn't do any good. Well, you're wrong. The answer is more. And he goes, I'm going to go to another group. And he goes over there. And he's just like the guy who can't get drunk. 
He's going around and he's hearing the truth everywhere he goes and he's looking all... And if you ask him what he's doing, he says, I'm looking for the truth. I'm searching the world to find the truth. And he's hearing it every single place he goes. He's hearing it from his friends. He's hearing it every single... Boom, boom. It's like a broken record. More, more, more. What we have, in my opinion, is a solution. We have the solution. I believe that we have a power that's capable of doing anything. I believe this power that can get an alcoholic who is so negative and in a matter of a week put a spark of life in there that is infectious, put a spark of life into a human being that was about to commit suicide that's now running around saving the world is a rather powerful power. And to resort to that only as a last resort is to have our priorities wrong. And I think in AA we came up with a slogan that says, first things first. Go to the higher power first and then come back and let's look at the problem. And the funny thing about that approach to life, rather than zeroing in on the problems, figuring out, analyzing, figuring out what the hell they are, we go to the solution first. Always go to the solution. AA is a solution. There was a Beatles song that says, there are no problems, there's only solution. And what we have here is the solution. And what a solution. And we don't solve any problems in Alcoholics Anonymous. Alcoholism for us has never been solved. It's been removed. It went away. I don't know where the hell it went. I have no idea why I'm an alcoholic, why it would be any of those dynamics. All I know is I don't think about it anymore. It went somewhere. It went away. It went off like some of my childhood went away. And I'm thinking about different things. I'm at a different level. I have a different higher power. I have a way of growing. I'm part of something that is moving ever upward, and I have to move with it or go away. And I don't want to go away. And if you're new, I don't want you to go away. Because you can't get to this place alone where we can get together. That is the message that's here. You can't get there alone. That's why we stay together. And where we get, it is incredible. And if you are new, you stick your hand out, we're going to grab it, and then next year I'm going to be sitting out there hearing where you are. And I'm going to enjoy immensely where you are because I'll be part of it. And it'll be part of my joy, too, sharing where you are. All of you that are here tonight, I love you desperately. You're just a wonderful crowd, and thanks a lot. Thank you so much, Sandy, for coming and sharing. Earlier this week, I heard an alcoholic is described by one little boy to another boy as being a happy person who didn't drink. I think that fits Sandy right well. Tonight, we've asked Ralph E. to give out our chips. My name is Ralph Edgar, and I'm an alcoholic. Hi, everybody. It's good of you to share with us, Sandy. We love you here, and your dedication and work in this beautiful fellowship is truly an inspiration to us. And here at the Charter Group, we have the CHIP system. The CHIPs are merely a symbol of our progress in our program. They mean different things to each of us. To me, I like to think of the chips as the freedom chips. Until I joined you, I had no freedom of choice, and today I have a freedom of choice. And I like to think of my chips as the freedom chips. And if you have a desire to stop drinking, we will give you the white chip. And after 30 days... If you're like I was, you begin to hear what the people are telling you in the program, and we will give you the silver chip. And after three months, it will be the red chip. This is a danger signal for us because after three months, I was feeling good, and I felt that maybe I could do it again. But don't do it. Let's go on for the golden chip, the six-month chip, a piece of gold. 
and things are getting much better for us now. And then we have the nine-month chip, which is the green chip, the green for gold for the 365 days. And after 365 days, we have the blue chip. And what a beautiful way of life. Do we have anyone tonight that would like to try our way and take a white chip? This may be the most important thing that you have ever done in your life. Anyone for a white chip? Anyone for 30 days? The silver chip. Come on. days in the red chip. Anyone with 90 days? Six months for the gold. <laughs> That's the added benefit you get if you're giving out the chips. How about the green? Nine months. Any sneakers for a year? All right. Oh. My name is Patty Weaver, and I'm an alcoholic. Okay. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> I am sober through the grace of God and this program of Alcoholics Anonymous. This is, I'm celebrating two anniversaries this day. Without the first, I'm celebrating my ninth year in Alcoholics Anonymous today. And also, I'm celebrating, I've been married one month today, and I'd like for you to meet my husband, Bill Weaver. Stand up, Bill. <laughs> This, uh, I had always before picked up my chip in our group. I'm from Warner Robins, Georgia, and I had picked up this chip. We have give the uh, birthday chips just once a month, you see. And I had never picked up my chip before on the exact date. And when I heard you were speaking here tonight, Sandy, mm -hmm. I uh, met you through my husband. He had your tape, and I fell in love with you then. Loved your, uh, loved your, and I'm so glad that I could be here and share this with you all. Thank you. This has been a fantastic night, and this is, I believe, the sixth year that our... All right. planning on this. My name is John. I'm an alcoholic. Hi, John. Um, you know, I, heard, I heard a speaker, an alcoholic, not long ago talk about the typical alcoholic. If you give him a choice of two shirts in the morning, it'll take him a couple hours to, to make up his mind. The reason it took me a while to get up here is because it's not been exactly one year. <laughs> it's been about, you know, 14 or 15 months, but thank you. I'm glad to be here. Thank you. This has been a special thrill for me tonight. It is our sixth year to have the conference here on drugs and alcohol. This is a tremendous thing for our city here. And all of the great people that give of their time and the dedication that they make to this program really thrills me very much. I love you very much. And let's remember the beautiful promises. We're going to know a new freedom and a new happiness. And you have given me this and I, as I go down the road to you. I love you very much. Thank you. Uh, 
Our twelfth tradition reminds us that anonymity is the spiritual foundation of all our traditions, ever reminding us to place principles before personalities. It's all right for me to say that I'm an alcoholic and attended this meeting. It's not all right for me to say that you're an alcoholic or that I saw you here. I'm going to ask L.E.C. if he would come up and lead us in the Lord's Prayer. Those of you that will join us, please stand and join hands. Hi, I'm Ellie Cato, and I'm a grateful alcoholic, and it's a pleasure to be here tonight. And I cannot think of a better way for us to close a beautiful program such as we've had here today and crystallize that in our memory as by saying the Lord's Prayer. So if you'll join me at this time, we will have the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. <laughs>